Hi, Krish. Hi. Uh, nice to, to be with you today here. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Mi placer. Mm, gracias. <laughs> so for those who I think you are quite well known here in Spain, your book, especially the first one uh, from Codependent, de la Codependencia a la Libertad, uh, la libertad yeah. is quite is quite popular, very well known, I think, in the in the world of self-development. Uh, it, it's very popular, people really appreciate and it's it's one of those books that go from hand to hand and uh, mm. yes so from uh, in in english is face to face with fear right yes yes the first uh, one i wrote mm -hmm. and um so it's not your only book i really appreciate some of your other books as, uh, especially i really like your last one the flow of love uh, where I feel with Amana, you really uh, collect a lot of the key aspects of uh, conscious relating, um, which I really, really resonates deep uh, within myself. The, what you, the view on and, and the points and the ingredients yeah, that you collect in that book. Um, but yeah, uh, so you have, I think, eight books all together but not only together with Amana. Yes, yes. But not only as an author, yeah, you the founder of the uh, Learning Love Institute together with Amana. Uh, yes. And also you lead seminars and trainings all around the world where you train people, but also you train trainers, people who also offer this work in different countries. Yes. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know whether you want to add something to well, the introduction about your work. I think that basically intimacy is not easy, and uh, you know people really have to learn more about themselves and learn what they what they bring to. It's also a question of what people are looking for. You know. Because we always say that there's two movies. There's the movie one, which is just the energetic attraction. And that's wonderful. But movie two is more the journey of intimacy, mm. which is very, very different. You know, uh, we're going to get triggered. We're going to get dramatic. We're going to get disappointed, you know, because we bring a lot of things to the table based on our past and mistrust and so on you know and a lot of times people come with a lot of expectation from on their partner huh? and we work we work a lot with that because that that particular we call those the great saboteur you know that's it if the other person feels all those expectations they move away or they feel judged or they feel misunderstood and so on. So we work with, because expectations are natural, you know, because we, we didn't get what we needed as a child. So that's one thing we work with. We also work with how to help people be kind to each other, you know, mm -hmm. so that um, because love is so delicate, you know, so we want, we want them to be caring and kind and not to take each other for granted mm. you know i like i also, like to say uh to be compassionate yeah with each of us and with the other and with the relationship itself right. yeah? creating making a team rather than competing or yeah yeah and realize that it's not easy you know it takes it takes uh we are going to get triggered so we have to be aware that we're going to get angry, we're going to get disappointed, we're going to be frustrated, mm -hmm. you know. And one of the big ones is how the sexuality changes, you know. Um, it starts, maybe it starts very hot and very excited, and but then, you know, it changes and people have to find new ways to connect mm -hmm. with the sexuality and, you know, sometimes it's 
sometimes traumas come up, you know. Um, men have a castration wound that brings up shame. Women have can have sexual invasion from their past, and that brings up a lot of, you mm-hmm. know, body symptoms. So we work with that too, you know. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for this summary. We will have the opportunity to go a little bit deeper in some of these mm. uh, aspects you've mentioned today. I just wanted also to say that the, the focus of the interview is men. Uh, okay. So although we're probably going to cover aspects that are, are interesting and, and refer to both men and women, but I just since the beginning of this year, I've been bringing a lot of focus on, on the work I do and, and also on what I put out in the social media, on my community, a lot of focus on what happens particular to men, because in a way I feel it has been less visible, first of all, to, yes. to themselves, really, because they have not been so much a, an upbringing that has encouraged men to look inside. Uh, the focus has been more on goals, on delivering, on performing, on the outer world, and not so much on looking to what's happening inside. So there's initially this connection <laughs> within themselves and their, their own inner world, but also because of that, probably there's not so much visibility on the difficulties that men experience in relationship. I think it's more visible what women experience what the abuses and the difficulties, and, and I don't want to diminish that in any way. Um, but I want to also bring a lot of light and visibility to the difficulties that particularly men experience. So without really trying to avoid that if they, there's anything in the, in the conversation that is relating to women that we also talk to it, but just today we're gonna focus a little bit more um, into the male aspects, yeah? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the, the biggest things with men often has to do with they're not so in touch with their feelings. And so that's something, you know, emotional literacy, understanding feelings is something that we often have to teach guys. And without pressure, you know, just to feel. And a lot of times, The way to do that is through shame, through insecurity, through the castration wound, feeling like they're not enough. You know, men are always thinking, I'm not potent enough. I'm not achieving enough. I'm not attractive enough. I'm not, I'm not enough, you know, and that's the castration wound. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it's, it's global, but it's also genital. So we work with that. That's a big issue. And that's, you know, and that usually comes from having a, a very strong mother or an angry father, you know, which can cause a shrinking in the, in the man or an aggression, you know, either mm. one or the other. So aggression or collapse is a, a way of the, the castration wound shows itself and they don't know that, you know, they don't know what's happening, you know. And sometimes also we notice sexual addiction is a very common symptom of the castration wound because they're trying to get the excitement to cover up the insecurity. Yeah. 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 I I would like you to go a little bit deeper into that a little bit later um, and into really what the castration wound is and how we shows itself in these different aspects of the relating. But before that, I would love to start with with a question, which is why intimate relationships are so difficult? Why there is so much suffering into into these particular relationships, yeah? Well, I think that people often enter relationships in fantasy. They don't really know what's coming. Mm. They're, you know, they're motivated by attraction. They're motivated by conditioning. This is how a relationship should be, you know, and, and it's all bullshit. You know, it's all, it's, it's like, 
normally people are not modeled in healthy relating from their childhood, mm. you know. So people don't have any idea for the most part, what is a relationship? You know, how is it going to work? You know, that's why we wrote that last book. It's like, um, mm. so that's the first thing is to deal with the fantasy, the romantic fantasy, because it's not going to last, you mm. know. And then there's a shock. So they get disappointed. The sex goes down. Um, they feel like they're not getting the support that they expect. You know, men want a lot of support. They want a lot of uh, validation for their energy, for their mm. sexuality, for their achievements, right? And often they'll put that on the woman, you know. You need to satisfy me or you need to support me or you know or sometimes men become rescuers you know mm. and then they get resentful you know which the rescue aspect is another wanting validation yeah uh... yeah it's a way of feeling like they deserve love mm. but it doesn't work because they reduce the other person to a child and then they get upset that the other person is a child mm. you know? and so, it's also Krish is also a way of avoiding feeling their own wounds um, exactly yeah. they're all compensations you know mm -hmm. covers and so men often will cover their wounds with power trips with money with sex um with needing to be right you know with opinions mm. um so that's how men cover their their wounds they cover their insecurities so you know one of the biggest steps that i find when i'm working with a man is are they really willing to feel their shame their insecurity their fear because many men are conditioned that that's not okay to feel that stuff, you know? Mm. So I go, well, okay, but if if you don't let yourself feel this part of you, it's kind of hard for somebody to get to know you. Mm. Yeah. And do you know, for me, it's, it's important also when we talk about this to be very compassionate because men have not been encouraged to really... Right. <laughs> To really and um, look inside to feel their insecurity, to feel their pain, even their sadness, you know, from very little when a man, a, a child, you know, a boy cries, is don't cry, yeah. Uh, don't don't go there. So so they've been discouraged to to really feel and 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 express their vulnerability, yeah. So now, many years later, <laughs> they realize right. that that's on the way of intimacy. Of, of, mm. I mean, a lot of times I share my own experience because I was conditioned without feelings. I was conditioning to be the best, to perform. And I realized at a certain point in my life that this was not going so great, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I started to do therapy, you know. I started to work on myself because uh, – I wasn't really present in, in a relationship. I was a complete rescuer, you know, being a doctor, I could easily feel fit into that role of being the, the rescuer, but it wasn't working, you know? So I remember when I started therapy, the therapist said to me, so how was your childhood? And I said, my childhood was great. And she said, well, we have a lot of work to do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> mm. so you know i mean i i tell men look you know i went through the same thing so it's up to you you know but if you want love in your life and if you want to be a real person you're going to have to feel your wounds mm. so what are um krish in your own experience in your own uh, transformation your own path what has been the the most important realizations or transformation or steps that have moved you from, you know, from codependency or from fear that you talk a lot about fear, yeah, to, to, yeah. 
to freedom, to love? Well, I would say, yeah, I would say, I mean, first of all, it started when I was in my psychiatric residency and, and one of my teachers handed me a tape on codependency and I was very arrogant and I, you know, I was already a sannyasa and I didn't think that I had anything to learn. And I put this tape in, it was back in the day when it was cassette tapes. And I put, I was driving to, to work to the hospital and I put it in, and I realized that this tape was completely about me, that I was completely codependent. So that was the beginning. And then I, I started reading everything I could about codependency and, and I really took a hard look at myself, you know, my shame, I started to go to seminars about shame. And so that really helped. That was one big step, mm. you know? And then to be honest, I, I also realized that the conventional world was not for me, that I needed something more. So many different experiences, you know, I did some psychedelics for a while, but actually it all basically guided me to India to, to be with, well, I had other gurus, but none of those gurus really worked for me. So I was looking for a teacher. And then when I met Osho, I knew he was my teacher, you know. So I, I spent learning a lot, you know. And then, of course, since then, you know, that period is also over. But, um, well, it's over in the sense that I'm not living in the commune anymore and so on, you know. But... So I would say, and then I also started to do deep trauma work. And I started to realize that I have fear inside and that I will always have fear inside and that I've learned to meditate on my fear, you know, to work with it. And, you know, so these are the, I would say the three big things that I could say, you know, and then meeting Amana, you know, I had many relationships, but I didn't get it right until I met her. Mm. And then somehow, I, I had enough consciousness to to not perfect, but good enough, <laughs> so that over the thirty years we've really developed a very deep love, and we're we're very good, good with each other. We're very kind with each other. Or, you know, I learned how to do it right, so I can teach that because, you know, I can walk that. You know, not perfect, and but it's never perfect. You know? mm. And you know that's but it's yeah that's one of the reasons i invited you not only because you do all this work but because i i know i feel and that that it comes from from a living experience yeah from from having <laughs> transformed yourself from <laughs> from the path of fear to to something bigger yeah? Uh, yeah i mean it's not easy you know when we started we had our issues but over the years we've worked through our issues because we we care for each other, you know, and we realize that drama is not as important as love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So if there is a decision, yeah? There is a choice? It is a decision. It's always a choice, mm -hmm. Ramon Mui. It's always a choice. And that's what people don't realize. They think that they're a victim of their emotions, but they're not, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I always say in my workshops, do you choose love or do you choose to be right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. And being right is just a cover for an ego, you know, the ego thing. Because the ego basically, I think love is, deep love is probably an ego smasher. Mm. The ego doesn't survive so well, you know, because mm. it's, it's dumb. The mm -hmm. ego is dumb. It's stupid. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Chris, you mentioned that some of the difficulties is that we approach relationships as with from fantasy, <laughs> expectations, the need of validation, the need to to cover our own wounds, our sense of lack somehow. Yeah. Um, now, how, what was the alternative? <laughs> Well, how do we move out from here? You know how? Yeah. 
Well, you know, we talk about different stages of a deep relationship. The first is the courting phase, where we're, and then there's the honeymoon phase, where we're still in projection and fantasy. Mm-hmm. And then the shit hits the fan. Then we start to get triggered. You know, we get triggered in one of two ways. We either get triggered because we're not getting what we want, or we get triggered because we feel the other person isn't being respectful. So we need to learn two things. We need to learn boundaries. We need mm-hmm. to learn to be able to hold on to our ourselves, our integrity, our authenticity. And we also need to accept that the other person is not going to be everything that we want to, that they have their own life. They're not here for us. They're here for them, you know. So we have to kind of, and that is a deep one. That's the abandonment wound. That's the feeling of, I'm not getting what I hoped I would get, you know. And that's, we call that breathing into the burn. You've, you know, but most people, they go out from the burn and either try to change the other person or criticize or analyze. And we tell people, we suggest you go in with the burn, the frustration, the disappointment, and feel it, breathe, that, and know that that's just going to happen, you know. So, and it also makes you mature. If you always think the other person's going to be there for you, you stay a child, you know. Mm-hmm. Because we're alone in this world. But being alone, we can really share with each other. Once we accept that, you know, I recently did a session with a couple and they spent the whole time fighting, an hour and a half fighting. I said, (laughs) guys, this is not going to (laughs) work. Your idea of relationship is completely wrong. They didn't like my saying that, but I felt like I had to say it, you know. Mm. You're still basically behaving like children. This is not how love works. Mm. Yeah. So the shift is through responsibility, yeah? Taking yes, that's responsibility, right. Each one for their own world, their own wounds, their own well-being, yeah? Right. And the thing is that it's, a, it's like you don't always know that a wound is being triggered. The first thing is you get angry or disappointed, you know, or you feel that disrespected or misunderstood, you know? This, and then it's like, our nervous system is so fast that we react, you know? Mm. So it isn't like people automatically go, ah, my abandonment wound got triggered, uh, or now I feel insecure and I need to share my insecurity with you. No, they don't do that. <laughs> you know, they get that, and then people don't like to feel discomfort. And, yeah. you know, for me, Krish, um, I just want to say this because I don't know whether how much people that are, might be listening to us are aware of this work for dependency, the wounds, the inner childhood wounds. Yeah. But before I did this work myself, I, you know, I had no clue. Whenever I had difficulties in my relationship, I had no clue <laughs> what was happening. I had no way of understanding it was just for me it was a a big confusion what is it I was fine five minutes ago and now my partner had just said a tiny little thing and it's all just a big mess a big thing Uh, my you know a whole roller coaster of emotions and I could not understand well why I how I could not explain because I was not understanding myself what was happening within myself I had no emotional awareness at all you know and i'm a woman (laughs) which i've been more encouraged than men to really look inside but even myself i had no awareness of my inner world of what was happening no awareness of my wounds nothing yeah (laughs) so it's beautiful that you say that it shows me that you've done a lot of work on yourself you know because a lot of people would wouldn't be so honest you know, has to say that, you know. So that's beautiful, Mama Marie. That's beautiful. You know, it shows me that, wow, you're very sincere. You know? And do you know, at that time, you know, at some point I had done a lot of Tantra, 
you know, I was even facilitating Tantra, but no, and I remember <laughs> at some point I was, uh, had a Danish partner and he was also a Tantra facilitator. We both were facilitating together. Uh, no, none of us had awareness of our, you know, inner wounds. And so we were very confused because we, we transformed lots of things through the Tantra work that we had each done. And we had transformed our sexuality and it was beautiful in some ways, but at some point we will touch spaces where there was like, wow, now how do we deal with this? <laughs> All right, that's beautiful that you have brought this awareness into the Tantra work, mm. because I think that sometimes I feel that's missing, you know? Yes. Yes. So that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And and so um, that's that's when I realized tantra is not enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people were coming to to me with um, with couple issues. You know, thinking tantra will answer some of those issues, and in some cases it did. In some cases it did, but in my own relationships, sometimes you know. I didn't know how to deal with the conflicts and with the difficulties I was having. And it was only after doing this work that I could <laughs> start to offer, offer some help to, in some cases, to, to bring some light. Um, and that's when I started to work with both after having done myself the work, yeah. But I just would like to, to offer to the people that are listening to us, maybe some basic understanding of what are the main wounds? Okay, we talk about three. Mm -hmm. We work with three. We work with the wound of abandonment, mm -hmm. which is showed itself in two ways. It shows itself either a feeling like I'm not getting enough or feeling like the other person is suffocating me. But both of them show something missing as a child in the sense of, getting your basic needs met, mm. which are either a symbiotic need to feel connected or a separating need to feel encouraged to be yourself. So that's the wound of abandonment okay. showing itself in either of these two. The second wound is the wound of shame and security, which is a deep inner feeling of not being enough. And it comes from childhood, from school, from the culture, you know, it comes from this constant feeling like you have to prove yourself, you know, mm -hmm. and that and when we go deeper with that, people, people hate themselves, they, they feel like they'll never make it. And we have to, we have to dig in there, we have to find, explore that, you know, we have to, and then once we explore that, then we can begin to help them discover their real self, you know, the real who they really are, you know, um, but you can't do the second without the first. There's a lot of therapists and teachers who try to skip over the shame work. And I don't find that very helpful because it's kind of spiritually bypassing mm. our wounded self. You know, take a drug, do a kind of a certain process and you don't have to feel pain. I just don't feel that that's very helpful. So it's true pain you know, what Gurdjieff once described as the tunnel. Uh, you go through the tunnel with help, you know, and then you come out really beginning to see what spiritually you're meant to be, you know. That's the second wound. The third wound is fear and shock. And that's a really a deep place of being frightened. You know, there's psychological fear and there's existential fear, you know. We're going to die. People are afraid of dying. That's existential. But then there's so many traumas and insults that we experience as a child that causes psychological fear. And that's, and it can be so much that we go in shock. So that's the third wound that we work with. You know? So mm. those are the wounds. Yeah. And, and being aware and having brought, you know, this, this summary of the wounds, what would you call um, codependent relating? Codependent relating is trying to get 
something from the outside that we don't feel on the inside, okay? So that can be a person, that can be a substance, it can be sex, it can be um, just socializing, it can be shopping, it can be all these distractions that we go to, that's all codependency. We're codependent on the shopping mall. We're codependent on another person, you know? We're, and so that's the bottom line. All the, addic all the addiction, basically. Yeah. All the addictions are codependency. Mm. And the thing is that it's deep. It's, you can't just stop an addiction because you choose to, it's deep. You have to go under and feel what's driving that, you know? Um, recently I worked with a couple that both of them have a sex addiction so they leak their sexuality with other people and they stop trusting each other so I said okay let's go deeper okay you play these games okay I'm not judging it but you can see that it's damaging your relationship let's find out why you're doing this what is the root of that what's the root the root is that I don't feel good in myself. I need excitement. I need to run away from myself. That's the root. Yeah. Mm. So or I, alcohol or whatever. Yeah. Or yeah. weed, you know. Mm. Um, so it's really this work take us to to finding love within rather than outside. Yeah. Really going back to to the source of love within. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not easy, you know, that's not easy because as a child, we, we, we don't get the love inside. We need it from the outside. So it's natural we grow up, we still have that conditioning, that belief. I didn't get it. I need to get it now. So eh, it's a process, you know, mm. process. And it's not like it, it changes overnight. It's not like, okay, now I get it. No. It's, it's constant. You get disappointed because your partner is um, not available or they're busy or, or whatever, or they're not interested in making love as much as you want. Boom, there it is again, you know? Okay, feel it. Come back, come back, breathe, be with yourself. And what I discover, what we discover is if you really breathe into it, it starts to feel better. You know. I, I love that what you said for me is feeling, you know, feeling is rather than avoiding, which is the tendency that most of us have is really whenever there's some intense feelings, instead of really breathe and feel into it, is we just go into the mind, analyzing, solving, or, or, or covering with, with addictions, yeah? Mm. While it's through, it's through feeling that, that it transformed by itself, yeah? without doing anything. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage mm. to breathe into the discomfort, you know. Mm. That's a lot of courage. So, you know, courage and stick with it. Don't just think you're going to do it once. <laughs> yes. You know. Because it needs to break through a, a deep um, habit, yeah, a, an old-time habit of going somewhere else. Right, right. Mm. You know, we're a very addictive society, the West, you know, well, every, everywhere, but we're, people are definitely addicted prone, you know, they want to get the, those good feelings in the brain, those good neurotransmitters, they want to get that going, you know, so they'll do anything to get it going, you know, you go shopping, you get a dopamine rush, um, you know, you get uh but what we really want to encourage is oxytocin, which is the connection of, it's the hormone of connection. And that's the best of all. That's just, ah, oh, feels so good in the heart, no? Yeah. But you have to work for that. You have to be loving and kind and relating with each other to get oxytocin going, you know? Yeah. So. How, how does it happen? What's the way? Well, so, so you teaching, it, you have your institute is called, I love the name, Learning Love. Yeah, Learning Love is like, oh, wow, love can be learned. We haven't been taught. <laughs> that's right. 
That's right. Yeah. yeah. We really haven't learned. We haven't seen good role models for it in 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 our upbringing, our parents, our families. You know. So how do we learn? What what's the way? Well. I think two things. I think we need to know our own story, but we also need to know our partner's story, not just our partner, any good friend, because that makes for empathy. We need to know what triggers them. We need to know what, what makes them happy. We can't always make them happy, but we're sensitive. Empathy. Empathy is a really big one. Okay. You just feel the other person, you know, um, and it's almost like the other person is always in you. So that, you know, that's one thing. But then you also have amazing, you have to know your own triggers, your own sensitivity. You have to know what's going to piss you off. Ah, if you know what's going to piss you off, then you know, okay, so I got pissed off when? Like I learned my own triggers, my own sensitivities. I know what pisses me off you know, because of my childhood. So I know that, you know, and so I know, ah, okay. If I get a trigger, I'm going to have an emotional reaction. I'm not beyond that yet. <laughs> I have an emotional reaction. I know why it happened usually. And now I know, okay, I just be with that. Okay. And it passes. But if I act out from it, then it lasts, you know, if somebody insults me or somebody, maybe somebody thinks I did a bad session, I go, okay, happens, breathe. But if I go out from that, it's going to make a mess. You know? um, so. Yeah. What do, what else do we need to learn about love? So first of all, so it's a self, you, what you mentioned right now, it's a self-awareness process about what are my wounds, what are my triggers, how do I react? Also be in empathy with the other, yeah? What right. are the triggers to be sensitive? Mm -hmm. I also think that everybody has to have a life. In other words, have a life. Okay. Have a life so that you have other resources that you don't put all your eggs in your partner basket. You know, that is so important. You know, I have my hobbies. You know, I have the things that I like to do. I'm a tennis player. I play the guitar. I do things that I like to do. Or, I, you know, I have other friends. You don't give up your friends when you go into a relationship. So have a life. I tell people, have a life, you know, so that you can feel good in yourself and you don't depend on your partner to make you feel good. So that's really important, you know. And sometimes that, um, Trish, especially in men, I feel there is, it feels that there is a, uh, a conflict in between mm -hmm. having a life <laughs> and having a partner. <laughs> right, that is like a conflict. Like freedom well, it and can be. yeah? Mm -hmm. Right. But I don't think that that's really a conflict. I think that you can really have both, you know. Mm -hmm. And my relationship with Amana, we have our own life, you know, things that we like to do. I always say, be the guardian of the other person's freedom. You protect the other person's freedom with your mm -hmm. consciousness. Don't mm -hmm. fuck with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because that's so valuable. You know. Be the guardian of your own freedom and be the guardian of your partner's freedom. That makes sense, you know? Yeah, I, beautiful. I never heard that expression that, uh, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. So does that include having other partners? You know, that's a big issue we deal with. And again, it's a choice. What we tell people is you can do it and it's fine if that feels like the right thing for you. And for some people it is but it's going to make trust more difficult mm. because we're so wounded. So I have in all my years, 40 years now working with people, I've never really found that it worked unless they lie. And then if they lie, then it usually doesn't work after a while because they discover it in the other person's phone or you know mm -hmm. how it is, right? So it's okay because everybody's different. 
but that's not something that we include as freedom, unless that's what you want. If somebody says, oh, I wanna make love to many different people, go, okay, well, let's see how that works for you. Let's see if you know one year, two years down the road, whether it's still working, if you still feel nourished in your relationship, if you're still vulnerable with each other, if you're still sharing and so on and so forth, you know? Okay. Mm. And I don't have any rules. Yeah. 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 Um, I've lost what I was gonna say. Oh, one of, sometimes also this, this freedom is, is also a way of escaping when there is, yeah boredom yeah. let's say boredom or conflict or difficulties you know right. or, or, or wow i'm getting too intimate i'm getting too close to this person she's gonna see that i'm not good enough so let's <laughs> you know let's if people go else. deep if they go deep into love they're gonna have to face some fears fear of exposure because there's no secrets when love really happens they're mm -hmm. gonna have to feel the fear of losing themselves because they want love so bad that they might give up their, themselves. That's the second thing. Mm. Or they might be afraid of rejection because if somebody really, really matters to you, whoa, littlest things can make you feel the fear of rejection, you know? Or as you said, and then there's the fear of invasion, so you have to have your boundaries. And the last thing is fear of boredom because if a couple doesn't keep growing together, they're gonna get bored. You know, so these five things are really important, you know, that you have to know that that's the challenge of deep intimacy, you know. You know, I I can get a little bit nervous if Amana goes and gets a, a haircut and comes back an hour later than, then I start to think, oh my God, she had an accident. I mean, we get very sensitive, you know, or if the, our partner has an illness or an operation, it, that's the thing. Things get really sensitive when you love, you know? Mm. We call it conscious dependency. Yes, your emotions are dependent on the other, but you're able to be with it. You know what I mean? Yes. Mm. So if we could illustrate, I don't know whether this is easy. <laughs> what does a healthy conscious relating looks like versus a codependent relating with some examples or okay just make I, it very very that. easy to yeah very easy to get well one thing is drama an, an unhealthy relationship is full of drama and and another aspect is they throw energy at each other without apologizing without realizing that that's damaging because we're so sensitive inside mm. especially if we had you know, aggression as a child, you know, um, or we, we abandon each other without being sensitive to our fears of abandonment. You know, yes, be free, do your own thing. But if you're going to, you know, if you're gonna be away four hours, two hours longer than you said, make a phone call, you know, that kind of sensitivity is important, you know um know each other no no you know be aware of each other these are the good news the bad news is that we throw energy at each other we act out we um blame blame you know blame or complain mm. we analyze you know each other um i was really recently working with a woman who kind of became her boyfriend's therapist. Mm. And I said, that's no good because that's going to trigger his, his castration wound. He's going to feel like you're turning into his mother. And that's the unsexiest thing in the world. You know? And that's exactly what happened. You know? He shut down to her and she doesn't realize that that's part of the reason is, you know, he had a very abusive mother. And if you be his therapist, you know, so we have to be aware of these things, you know? Mm. And also I think that we will be, we will start to feel that the other person is one of our parents in some ways. And that's just the way it is. 
So you need to recognize they may have personality traits that are like your mother or your father. Okay. Because we attract that, you know. Mm. Somehow so as a second the... opportunity to, to heal, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that's why we do it, one of the reasons. Mm. Unless it's an abusive situation, you know. Because if we had an abusive parent, we can often create an abusive lover. So mm. I help people to work, you know, Amana and I help people to love themselves enough to get out of that situation. So yeah, one of the key things is always the inner work is to really to learn to love yourself. Yeah, oneself right. to otherwise there's always gonna be there's no way out of codependence. <laughs> right. Yeah, mm. that's right. Mm. Which isn't easy, you know, it's not easy. People yeah. say love yourself, but it's easy to say it. <laughs> yeah. And um I always say, you know, if you if we don't do it, it's always like we we begging into relationship, and at the same time, it's not that we have to have everything sorted to relate. Otherwise, we will never. No, relate. <laughs> no, that's a good point, Ramabri. That's a good point. We don't have it have have to have it all worked out. We can use relationship as a great arena for growth. Mm -hmm. One of the best, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, because shit comes up. We get triggered. Once somebody matters, once we're attracted, stuff is going to come up, you know. And, and it's an intimate relationship is one of the best mirrors, yeah, to really see everything that we don't normally see when we are alone, that everything seems to be fine, yeah? Yeah, it's a great mirror. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't really see that at first, that it's a mirror, you know. They try to smash the mirror. Oh. I say that, you know, one of the different differences of a unconscious or codependent relationship and a conscious one is that we recognize that the other is the mirror. <laughs> right. Because the conflict and the difficulties are going to appear in both. One way or the other, they're going to appear, yeah. In, when, when we are conscious, we just know that the other is reflecting and, and it, it brings us back to ourselves, yeah. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's a world apart between conscious and unconscious relating. Mm -hmm. It's a whole other universe. You know? Okay. So, so you say, you know, uh, relationship is a great way into self, you know, self knowing and growing, yeah, into growing further and faster. <laughs> So that's one of the main benefits of relating consciously, obviously. I think there's I think there's two benefits, to be honest. One is one is growth and the other is the ultimate nourishment. Mm. I think that life doesn't get better. When I feel the love I have for Amana, things don't get better than that. Mm. It's like a feeling inside that you can't describe. Mm. And I I I, I feel sad for people who don't have that but to have that you have to work for it <laughs> you know you have to really be willing to go through the tunnel and and yeah again there's some people who feel that it's too much work or you know i'll never get it right and you know, I get that. I get that people get discouraged because it's not easy. I always say, stick with it. You will get it. I can't say when, but if you really want it, it'll happen. I can't say for sure, but my experience is that it happened. It happened. Now, it's never perfect. It's not like, you know, but it happened. You, you love, you're okay in yourself. You're okay in your life. And then it happens. So not perfect, but you're basically not looking to be saved anymore. Hmm. So what are the main difficulties on the path? Well, I would say that we have to create boundaries. We have to know what feels right and what doesn't feel right inside mm -hmm. and respect that. Because sometimes you have to say no. You know, two people have different desire systems. Two people are different. 
So sometimes your partner will want to do something. It doesn't feel right to you. Sometimes your partner will be wanting your attention and connection, but it's a time for you to want to be a, yourself. So you have to, but at the same time, you have to nourish the flower of love. You can't just spend all your time sitting on your meditation cushion or doing your sports. You have to also make time to connect. Mm -hmm. So it's both, right? Um, and you asked me what makes it work. I think you have to have adventures together. You have to do things together. You know, where we say there's three kinds of sharing. There's the sharing where you're just having fun together. It's not big emotional. It's just fun. You're taking a hike or adventures or, or you know, or doing the as Camino together or whatever, you know, something that has significance and is inspiring mm. and you do it together. You'll be watching a movie and you talk about it together. It doesn't matter. So there's simple entertainment and there's inspiring entertainment mm. or adventure or doing a workshop together, this kind of thing. That's one kind of sharing. Second kind of sharing is to share each other's emotional world with each other. Mm. How was how are you doing in your life today? Did you get triggered by this person or that person? Or are you worried about money? Or what are you worried about today? What is going good and what is going bad? You know, that kind of thing. That's the second sharing. Mm. The third sharing is the most difficult. And that's when you get triggered by each other. And that takes a certain skill to sit down and, and say, you know, when you did this, when you, whatever it is, when you made a date with those friends without telling me or something, you know, that hurts me because I like the need to be considered. That's all. That's the third type of sharing. And sometimes it can be more difficult than that. But I think that that's important. These things are important mm. in a good love, you know, and be kind to each other. Be, be aware of be make your other person feel like you're the friend and not the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes they will feel like an enemy and then you yes. just have to work on that. You know? Mm. Um, Chris, you also, we mentioned earlier boredom. Yeah. That's one of the right. things that really, and you said um, couples get bored when they stop growing <laughs> together. Yeah. Right. Uh, or individually, yeah. Or individually, yeah. Was the was the way, was the key to, to well, avoid uh, uh, for instance, Tantra. I think that sometimes I encourage people, and now that I know about you, that they do need some support mm. to bring their sexuality back, as long as that kind of approach is sensitive and not pushy and so on. So I think that that's one one thing that's important. I think it's also important for them to do inner work together, you know, uh, the kind of stuff that we do where you get to know your mm. wounded self, because if you don't work with it, you're not going to know it, you know, mm. you're not going to learn it from the internet. I mean, you can, but <laughs> usually, <laughs> um, um, I, I do things that are fun. Go, go to, you know, Go to Japan, go to take an adventure together, do the Camino together, do stuff that's inspiring, you know, together. Mm -hmm. Don't just get lazy. Don't get lazy, you know, because life is always about growing. If you stop growing, things get boring. You know, I have a, a friend and he doesn't do much and he suffers because things have gotten a bit boring for him, you know, because his fear is so great that he doesn't, you know, uh, mm. so, you know, get the fire going, you know? Yeah, yeah. For me... Go to concerts, listen to music, you know? Yeah. You know, boredom also comes when, when there is no truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a big thing. When there is no that's truth a big thing. in the relationship, so there honest, is no passion. There is no truth. There is no passion. There is no energy. There is like. 
Dishonesty will kill mm. energy. It's a big energy killer if mm. there's dishonesty. Mm. And, you know, because people, I mean, there's many people who have secret affairs, right? I have a guy that I know, I play tennis with, he has secret affairs. And even though he doesn't realize it, it's going to affect his relationship. Yeah. Mm. Because the delicate energy between two people is so sensitive that if there's something there that's unspoken, it will be felt, even though they may not know what it is, you see? So you're absolutely right. If there isn't honesty, now, does it mean you have to share absolutely everything? No, but you do have to share anything that can contaminate the connection. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. So, Krish, if we go a little bit practical now, what would be key practical steps you would recommend to men? You mentioned already a few things, but let's kind of, maybe we mentioned three. Even, okay. even if guys. we have some of the ones that we already mentioned, if you have to say three things, let's say for men, key steps, practical. Well, it changes from man to man because I have a men's group and the, and the men that I work with, they have different issues. But I would say that all men have to learn about their castration wound, their and their shame and their their insecurity around sexuality, but not only around sexuality, around performance anxiety in all areas, not just sexually. So that's one big thing. I think that men have to understand more about fear. Hmm. They have to understand how to be with their fear because if they cover it, something will get false in their hmm. energy. So they have to be, I find that men are the most courageous who are willing to really be honest with their frightened self, you know? So that's the second thing. And I'd say the third thing has to do with communication. And that's mm -hmm. a struggle for guys, you know, because they don't, I have many guys, I don't know how to communicate. I don't know how to communicate. I, don't, <laughs> I go, <laughs> Um, it's something they can learn. It's not like, it's not rocket science. It's not like it's just start to feel what's going on for you inside. What, uh, you know, what, and that a lot of that has to do with shame and fear. You know, men think that feeling means sadness and, and oh, the third thing is about anger. Yes, another thing is about anger because a lot of guys are irresponsible with their anger. So I send them to kickboxing or I send them, you know, a lot of people don't, they don't know how to do dynamic meditation. So I send them to, I just recently worked with a guy who's full of anger, full of anger. I get a kickboxing coach and make it about content, go to the gym, work on the energy, but also what are you pissed about? Work on it. You know, hit, you know, the gloves, hit that glove of your coach and get it out, get it out of your body. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to leak it on your partner or you're going to make your health suffer. Get mm -hmm. that energy out, but do it in a healthy way, you know. Mm -hmm. So those are the things I think are most important. Guys have a lot of anger. I had to work on my anger. Uh, you know, I love my kickboxing coach back in the day and. Now I, I hit a little yellow ball. Um, but see, this is important for guys because we are testosteroneized. And testosterone is energy. But if it doesn't get expressed healthy, it, you know, it can come out in, in sex. And that is no place for anger, you know, as you know. You know. Yeah. Mm. So I say, do not, do not, do not get your anger out when you're making love to a woman, mm. you know, a vagina is no place for anger. Mm. Uh, Krish, Krish, you mentioned the, a few times already the castration wound. What is it? Okay. It's, it's three layers. The first layer is the layer of compensation of trying to cover 
an insecure place inside. The second place is the shame, the emptiness, the feeling of devalued, not feeling enough, feeling really I'm not enough, I'll never be good enough, uh, I, I don't have the energy I need, I feel impotent, I feel like I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, you know, and that's the second layer. The third layer is, is just relaxing into who you are, relaxing into letting the energy flow through you, letting yourself be expressed by God, by existence. But that takes journey, you know. I can say that when I'm working in a workshop, I'm not really there. It just happens. Sometimes my ego gets involved, but not so much anymore. It's more like I'm in a flow. This is my gift. I know I'm good at it. I've done a lot of work, but it's not me. It's something else. I can't explain it. It's, you know, also when you're in loving somebody, it's not you. It's just love happening. That's the third layer. So I'd like to encourage people to get to, guys, to get to that place where they're, they're not doing themselves, they're being themselves. Mm. I love what Osho, one of the sentences of Osho, don't be proud, don't be guilty, just be. <laughs> just be, yeah. Just be, right. yeah. Mm. Which is, you know, which is not our conditioning. It wasn't my conditioning. B, what the fuck are you talking about, B? <laughs> <laughs> you know. mm -hmm. And this castration wound is both mm, for men. And okay, women. for women, it's a little different. For okay. women, it has to do with giving away themselves, their power. Mm -hmm. So, you know, women often will give away their power to men. Mm -hmm. They're not clear in their wise woman. They're not solid. They're not good with their boundaries. They're not, they're, they're thinking they have to satisfy the guy. They have to be de devoted to the guy. I mean, women, are, I think, are naturally devotional, but it's dangerous. You know, mm. it's careful. They have to, you know, be clear what's right and what isn't right. So women's castration wound is basically compromising and giving away too much of the farm. Too much of the, the finca. Yeah. Mm. You know. Thank you for clarifying the difference between, yeah. Mm. And I would like now to take, to ask you more about taking it to intimacy, to sex, yeah? Um, how kind of tantra and inner work relate? We have a few minutes yeah. left, I think. It's a good question, yeah. I think that, First of all, when people become vulnerable and deeper with each other, sex is gonna change. They're gonna get scared. They're gonna be more sensitive. So they have to adjust. So they have to create safety. Safety, 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 safety. And every couple is different, but it's all about safety and connection. Safety and connection. And that has to be the most important thing, not excitement. So there has to be a transition from excitement. Now, excitement can come back once there is safety and connection, absolutely. But without, without safety, excitement can be addictive. Mm. And that's, that's, that's gonna destroy the relationship. You know? So what happens is that, that the sex becomes uh, either addictive or people stop making love, you know? And the other way is to create safety, to really communicate what, what is the fear, what is the insecurity, what is my body saying? Give, a lot of guys will lose their erection when they get their castration wound. They'll lose their erection, they'll come too fast. If a woman freaks out on that, that's a problem. Okay, so the woman has to say, okay, let's work with this. Because if a man gets, comes too fast or loses his erection, it's because he's gone into shock. Ugh. And so, you know, when we're in shock, 
we start to secrete a lot of uh, adrenaline and we got to get really anxious, we come or we lose our erection. Because without the parasympathetic nervous system, the erection will go away. Okay? So that's one thing for guys. For women, oh, so many issues. So much sensitivity in, in the yoni. You know, be aware, be, feel your, your wife's yoni is talking, your woman's wife, yoni is talking to you. Hear it, you know, listen. So that's part of the transition. So safety, connection, communication, um, awareness that things will change, you know, with time. And a lot of people are addicted to excitement. Mm. But there is also, it's... sorry, sorry, Kush. No, go there ahead. There is also a belief, no, that that sex has to be exciting, <laughs> and if it's right. not exciting, there is something wrong with it. And it's not, right, yeah, right, right. Which is, I get that. I get that. That that especially guys. Guys are much more. I think, in my experience more addicted to excitement than women. Women, on the whole, like softer sex. Mm -hmm. Not always, not always. But it is not easy to get over that. When, when I did a seminar with Amana years ago, and it was two weeks of not coming, that was a real transformation for me. And then later, you know, coming, no coming didn't matter. But the addiction to coming, I could see that addiction, you know, chasing the orgasm, right? Yeah, and and for me, that was exploring that also with a partner. Um, the trick for him, it was to, to go through it, the not coming, yeah? To find out that there was something better. <laughs> <laughs> but if great. you don't know it, if you have not experienced yeah. something more nourishing, then obviously that's going to be there. I know there is no other reference. And yeah. right, exactly. So, but they don't unless they're willing to find that other thing. Uh, some guys do, though, if they're sensitive, if they're aware that 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 space you just described is definitely there. If you're willing to go there. But a lot of guys say, oh, without excitement, what's the point? Right? Yeah. But that's where kind of the work of Tantra also kind of fills a little bit the, the space yeah. and the decades and yeah. shows and offer opportunities to, to taste. Exactly. And that's like what you're describing, what I would call good Tantra, will help guys to go there. Mm. You know. Mm -hmm. So definitely want to recommend people to come to your workshop. <laughs> yes and i try to combine also with with the codependency work because it's not enough <laughs> well, i can feel that that's great mm -hmm. it's great and chris chris i'm aware a little bit of the time that um i wonder whether you would like to say something before we finish something we haven't covered or some of the work you're doing um well, I mean, we work in two ways. We work, well, we're training teachers. We do that, but we do two things. We, we do our trainings where we really go deeper and we do our workshops. And we also work individually with couples. And, and basically it's pretty much everything we've been talking about in the last hour. And so that we just help people to how to make a relationship work, how to get to know their wounds, how to make their life a song. You know, I really would like people to make their life a beautiful music and it's totally possible, mm -hmm. you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, and also one last thing is that we, we don't confront people's defenses. We don't do that. We try to a different approach, which is to try to help them understand that the defenses are the way that we covered our wound. There are strategies of survival. And it's, it's okay, but if you stay in your defenses, you probably are gonna miss out on life. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a gentle approach, you know. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, we are going to be doing, I just mentioned it in Amaluro, the, the, uh, the Correpedencia a la Libertad, which is what we call learning level one. And it's a very deep process of learning how to make love work, you know. Mm. And that's happening next July, right? In Spain? No, in June, June, in June. 7 to 11. Yeah. 7 to 11. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So welcome. So, <laughs> with Spanish translation. Okay, so both yeah. in English, so it's open for English people yeah. and Spanish. Yes, right. The training that we do in Italy in August, that's only for English speakers. We don't have translation. Okay, yeah. not even but into Italian. All, um, no Italian translation. No, okay. no translation at all. We used to do it, but we changed. Okay. Because there are people coming from all over the world and we just couldn't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's great to get to know you. Thank you so much, Chris. Great to know you too. <laughs> a real pleasure, yes. a real honor. Thank you so much for your timing. And I will, uh, for everyone that is listening to us today, and I will put you the link to your um, website and also right. maybe the to the calendar where it's advertised your workshop here in Spain next summer and to any other trainings that you do. Um, great. Thank you so much. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Ciao.